and by the way, while we're waiting, congratulations on, on your 45th anniversary. Uh, that's quite an accomplishment. I, I like, uh, like Dave said, I do a lot of civil round table meetings and, uh, and I'm also involved as an advisor on the civil war round table Congress. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a wide disparity in, in the successes of, uh, of civil roundtables these days, so it's it's really good to uh, to see an organization that's that's thriving like yours. So, uh, can everyone see the uh, first page of the PowerPoint there? Yes, we've got it. All right. Well, let's get going then. So, it's 10 a.m. on April 7th, 1862, and a brigade of Union soldiers from the Army of the Ohio rushed aboard the steamer John J. Rowe at Savannah, Tennessee. They steamed upriver, then floated across and docked at a place called Pittsburgh Landing. As they disembarked, General Ulysses S. Grant ordered one regiment, the 32nd Indiana Infantry, to detach from their brigade and march immediately to the battlefield. As they began their march, the regiment's brass band struck up their favorite tune to get them excited for battle. The men sang at the top of their voices to this music. And if you can identify this tune, please just type it in the comment section. I'll be playing it on my phone and here we go. Can't hear it. Can't hear it? Did you hear that? Am I going to have to sing it to you? <laughs> no, there is one guess. Is that? Uh, it, was, it, was hard, it was difficult to hear, but I think Gary uh, sereski has got it. Uh, yeah, got it nailed there. And what is it? What song is it? It's La Marseillaise, the French national anthem. That is correct. Well done. So, why are U.S. soldiers marching into battle? singing the French national anthem. Why not the battle cry of freedom or God save the union or any one of 9,000 patriotic songs that were published in the North during the Civil War? Perhaps even more confusing, this regiment, the 32nd Indiana Infantry, was composed almost entirely of German immigrants. Now, how do Germans and French feel about each other in the 19th century. Anyone remember Napoleon? The Franco-Prussian War? When we read the English translation of these lyrics, it gets even more puzzling. The typical Union soldier was not fighting tyranny or fearing that foreign invaders were about to murder their wives and children. Now this stanza makes a little more sense at first glance, but wait a minute. It's early April, 1862. The overwhelming majority of Union soldiers have little interest in freeing the slaves. They are fighting to preserve the Federal Union. And who are these kings that want to enslave them? Now to really understand 
why German Union soldiers are singing a French anthem and railing against the tyranny of kings and slavery, we need to change how we've traditionally viewed the American Civil War. This was not merely a sectional dispute within the family, Northern brother fighting Southern brother over strictly American issues. We need to adopt a more expansive global view of the bloodiest conflict of the 19th century world. Now, a number of terrific historians have been studying the American Civil War through a global lens recently, and these are two of my personal favorites. So I use the work of Don Doyle, Andre Flesch, among others, to provide context for my study of one particular German-American Civil War figure. So today I'd like to make three arguments. First, that the American Civil War was part of a long-term radical revolution focused on democratic government, workers' rights, and human freedom. That revolution was international in scope and unprecedented in world history. Secondly, recent immigrants in general and German immigrants in particular, played a decisive role in the ultimate success of the Union Army. And finally, radical 48er leaders like Auguste Willisch helped transform a war to preserve the Union into nothing less than social revolution, a revolution that was even more radical than the American Revolution of 1776. Now, when we talk about radicals and their revolutions in the 18th century, one thinker stands head and shoulders above the rest of his peers in terms of influence. Thomas Paine's classic Common Sense, published in 1776, sold more than 100,000 copies, the largest selling book proportional to population in American history. Paine helped inspire American founders to pursue independence rather than simply a redress of grievances against the English crown. He also claimed that this conflict was about human rights and social justice. Paine said, quote, the cause of America is in great measure the cause of all mankind. He went on to say, quote, my country is the world, and my religion is to do good. So the American Revolution that Paine helped inspire was certainly radical from a political perspective. The violent overthrow of a hereditary monarch being replaced by a democratic republic was transformational. But it stopped well short of the ideals of social justice and equality envisioned by Paine and promised in the Declaration of Independence. The American Revolution may have been a political earthquake, but it left social relations within the new country largely unchanged. The theme of political revolution conceived and executed by social elites like Washington was reflected in the international leaders who supported the Patriot cause. These three foreign generals were aristocrats and they fought for political freedom, not social reengineering. So Thomas Paine ends up in France and French radicals wasted little time in emulating the success of their American allies. They initiated an ambitious and sweeping social revolution. But they really overreached in adopting the most radical aims of Enlightenment philosophers. They believed that perfect equality was the natural order of things and leaders must impose it upon the entire populace whether they were ready for it or not. So romantic visions 
of a new social order devolved into a macabre nightmare. The American Revolution, in contrast, had more limited aims. It had been carefully planned and was carried through with a conventional army. The French Revolution, in contrast, relied on incohesive gangs of rioters. So the result in that case was chaos and terror. The French Republic soon disintegrated as popular general Napoleon Bonaparte consolidated his power and became emperor of France. And the dreams of French revolutionary leaders were abandoned for the time being. The first half of the 19th century witnessed the beginnings of a dramatic shift from a society of rural farmers and artisans to a workforce that was increasingly urban and factory based. So instead of having control over one's own labor and production, capitalists now controlled most industries and workers were paid in wages. Periodic harvest failures and the reluctance of rulers to consider liberal reforms increased the pressure on kings and princes throughout Western Europe. An outgrowth of French revolutionary socialism that was called communism was gaining support among middle class intellectuals. And tensions between liberal reformers and conservative elites finally came to a head in the watershed year of 1848, where as you might expect, all the trouble started in Paris. So it was a windy gray morning in February thousands of unemployed Parisians assembled on the Place de Madeleine. They were soon joined by 700 students who crossed the Seine singing La Marseille. Before long, street fighting ensued, barricades were erected, and two days later, King Louis Philippe abdicated. The rebels took turns sitting on his throne, and one scrawled this note, the people of Paris to all Europe, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Then they took the chair to the Bastille and they burned it. And out of those ashes rose the second French Republic. Now, despite the fact that there was no internet, no Twitter, news of this French revolt spread like wildfire and revolts erupted all over Western Europe. After some initial success, they were all crushed by reactionary forces and absolute rule reinstated. Fra France was really the last to submit when Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew crowned himself emperor. Shortly before these uprisings, Auguste von Willisch renounced his nobility and resigned from the Prussian army. He became one of the key leaders of the revolutions in the German states. He fought in three rebellions in the Southern Rhineland and in Baden before taking refuge in France, Switzerland, London, and then finally in America. In the face of so many failed democratic revolts in their homelands, these political refugees sought a place where they could live out their principles of free popular government and then eventually return to Europe and reignite their revolutions. However, the America where most of these dissidents settled was hardly the fulfillment of the French Revolution's promise of liberty, equality, and brotherhood. Now, America was indeed a free country, and it offered economic opportunity that was largely absent in Europe, but it was just as socially stratified as the old country. A large established base of American-born nativists resented this flood tide of European immigrants, and a huge permanent underclass of black slaves that were treated more like farm animals or worse, occupied the lowest 
rung on the social ladder. Once political refugees like Villish realized that hopes for further revolution in Europe had evaporated, they committed themselves to create a more perfect republic here in America. Like many of his fellow 48ers, Villish edited a German language newspaper, the first daily labor paper in America. In his opening editorial, he vowed to quote, support those reforms that are supposed to make this republic a truth for everyone. Besides his tireless efforts to promote labor unions and trade associations, Villish also formed alliances with local black leaders. And this caused him considerable trouble and even put his life in jeopardy when he led a multiracial torchlight procession to protest the execution of John Brown. He developed an original idea to transform the US into a workers' republic. Now his proposal would replace the Congress with a national trade assembly, thereby eliminating political parties and moving the country closer to its founding ideals, in his opinion, a true social republic, as he called it. So this was at best a novel but naive concept, and at worst, a radical and dangerous idea in the eyes of most conservatives. Villish welcomed the coming of the Civil War, not to save the Union, but to create a social revolution that would defeat the slaveholding aristocracy, preserve democracy and Republican government, and also secure the triumph of free labor. He hoped that this, in turn, would lead to better working conditions and ultimately to a revision of the relationship between labor and capital. In this new future, Villish dreamed that worker exploitation of all kinds would end and that wage slavery would be replaced by a more fair value for value exchange. Now exiled radicals from all over the Western world supported the Union war effort. Russia, Cuba, and Spain were represented, along with 140,000 Irish immigrants who looked to Thomas Marr as their hero. Immigrants from Norway and other Scandinavian countries had ethnic regiments, like the 15th Wisconsin of Villish's own brigade. Hungarians and Canadians fought for the Union, Prussian revolutionary Karl Schurz became the most accomplished German-American immigrant in US history after fighting alongside Villisch in Baden. Now, if you look at the numbers, the impact of immigrants and blacks on Union victory is indisputable. Together, they represented the majority of federal soldiers who served the Union in the Civil War. Foreign-born soldiers, for example, accounted for 25% of the Union Army's manpower, despite the fact that they represented less than 13% of the population. Immigrants from the German states, primarily from the Southwest, where these largest uh, rebellions actually took place, numbered more than 200,000. Many joined regiments or companies that were exclusively or predominantly German speaking. And they shared characteristics that made them unusually successful soldiers. They were on average two years older than their native born counterparts. And many came from Turner societies. These were German social organizations that featured military drilling and rigorous physical fitness. A large number, especially in the officer ranks, had combat experience in Europe, and this was something that their native-born counterparts almost always lacked. And their concentration in urban areas made them more resistant to diseases in camp. Most were either strongly anti-slavery 
or full-fledged abolitionists. And they were highly motivated to finish what they had started in Europe. For Villish and other recent immigrants, 1861 was like 1848 all over again. In his words, it involved, quote, the same rights of men against a combined conspiracy of a traitorous slave aristocracy with the same powers of the old world. The Germans were also anxious to prove that they belonged as Americans in the midst of virulent and even violent anti-immigrant sentiment. So Villisch personally rec recruited four companies and served in the all-German 9th Ohio Infantry. But by the summer of 1861, he was awarded his own command. Here we see Villisch with Lieutenant Colonel Henry von Trebbe, who actually fought against him in 1848, and Carl Schmidt, who is his aide in Germany and his adjutant in the 32nd. His men called Villisch Papa, and he referred to them as my little children or my fellow citizens. For some time, Villisch even refused to hire a chaplain. When a cleric was forced on him, that reverend lasted just six weeks. Villisch conducted graveside services himself, often ending by stressing that theirs was not a conflict over nationality, but a war that was in, quote, the interests of all humanity. Now, it's not my purpose here to give a blow by blow description of Villisch's military accomplishments, either in Germany or in the American Civil War. I have 10 chapters, eight maps in the book that do a pretty good job of that. But for a little flavor of just what kind of commander this man was, let's return just for a moment to the battlefield at Shiloh, where we last left Villisch and his men singing the French revolutionary anthem, La Marseille. They arrived on Stacy Field, where Villisch was supposed to be held in reserve, he immediately requested permission and was granted permission to pass to the front and make a bayonet charge. Before they moved, Villisch addressed his troops. Little children, today decides the fate of America. Then a shell burst overhead. If we are beaten today, everything is lost. Let us do our duty as a free man does. So Villisch and his regiment made five successive charges, changing front nine times in the process. Despite this display of, of technical skill and discipline, his troops were rattled after they outran their support on both of their flanks. So Villisch halted them, rode around to the front of his column, and with his back to the enemy, drilled them in the manual of arms until they regained their composure. In the meantime, men are dropping in the ranks from enemy fire. He would repeat this feat 18 months later at Chickamauga. Lew Wallace later described it as the most audacious act of bravery he had seen in the entire war. The New York Times penned an extraordinary tribute to the general calling him, quote, undoubtedly the ablest and bravest officer of German descent engaged in the war of rebellion. But in an immediate sense, Villisch actually failed in two of the three great causes of his life. He and his fellow revolutionaries did not overthrow the monarchs and princes of the various German states, nor did they create a unified German democratic republic. Villisch's unceasing efforts to transform the American political system into a social republic where workers controlled the means of production and received full value for their labor never gained serious traction. His effort to recruit 
and lead immigrant volunteers did help defeat the slaveholding aristocracy in the Confederate States, but the vision that Villish and Lincoln shared of a more perfect Republican nation was a lofty goal and would probably take generations to realize. By the 1865, it was actually the radicals who had won the American Civil War. This precious but fragile republic that Washington had founded had not been defeated. That outcome would have delighted the princes of Europe. Rather, popular government proved viable and resilient. It would take many years, but eventually much of Europe would finally follow America's example and either abolish the monarchy or make it purely ceremonial. The largest slaveholding empire in the world vanished overnight and with it about $3.5 billion in wealth. This was more than the total value of all U.S. manufacturing and railroads combined. $105 billion in today's dollars in terms of lost property. Talk about radical economic change. Equally significant is the idea that America would need to transition to a free labor economy overnight. And although many of radicals like Villish saw improved working conditions on the horizon, it really didn't work out that way as the Civil War stalled the labor movement. It took decades for unions to regain their pre-war momentum. The most radical outcome of the Civil War, however, was the transformation of chattel slaves into American citizens. This held the most promise for epic change. For a time, the entire racial hierarchy in the Southern states was turned upside down. With black men serving in Congress while many Southern white elites were stripped of the franchise. Radical reconstruction, however, ended in conservative reaction and we are still trying to erase the legacy of slavery and its successor, Jim Crow, 150 years later. Historian Eric Fauna writes that the enduring challenge of radicals is they must be, quote, willing to fight and lose for a long time before even achieving partial success. Military men like Villisch came from the well-educated German middle class but they grew to resent aristocratic dominance. They also resented the forces of rapid industrialization that robbed working people of their independence and their dignity and threatened to consign them to a permanent underclass. Their commitment to change and frustration with intractable rulers pushed them into radicalism and rebellion. The reddest of the red, as Villish was known by both friend and foe alike, clung stubbornly to his radical prescriptions and violent means even after such measures had failed. Rather than give up on his cherished democratic socialist principles, Villish and other rebel leaders emigrated from Germany in the hopes that they would find a warmer reception for their ideas across the ocean. Of course, the export of German revolutionaries and their ideology to America made some sense. After all, radicals throughout Europe had been working in concert for a Republican vision that at least in theory transcended national borders. The multicultural United States of America seemed an ideal place to continue that struggle. So Villish changed his tactics from system overthrow to extensive reform through existing legislative channels. He positioned the German-American sacrifice in the Civil War as an international human rights crusade. 
during frequent speeches to his troops. The general advised Union veterans to remain vigilant in the wake of victory, and he urged them to support democratic revolutions in the old world. Here's what he said. No temporary peace will undo the revelations of the times. Soon the voice of the people will be heard claiming the rights of men. And Village then urged his listeners to wave the American banner of human liberty above the storm as a pilot light for the struggling nations. Pioneering German sociologist Max Weber wrote that, quote, what is possible never would have been achieved if in this world people had not reached for the impossible. 19th century proposals like an eight hour workday, unemployment benefits, child labor laws, these were all once maligned as radical assaults on American institutions until they became mainstream public policy in the 20th century. And activists like Villish, who promote far-reaching reform, may be forced to wait decades or even centuries for favorable moments to, to take shape. And moreover, most extreme ideas never come to fruition. So circumstance and environment force Villish to change his tactics at times, but his core principles never changed. Indeed, they formed a prison, a prism through which he viewed everything, including the American Civil War. Here's what he said to a German American Union officer in 1862. Encouraging and promoting a solution to the social question is and will remain the only task of my life. This work alone not only makes life more challenging for me, but in my view, gives it value. So what larger lessons can we learn from the radical nature of the American Civil War? Well, revolutionary social, political, and economic change usually happens incrementally over long periods of time. But radical actors often provide an emotional spark that given the right timing and circumstances can create a tipping point event. And John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry is a good example of that. Brown's extreme acts made it easier for radical secessionists to convince many of their fellow Southerners that Lincoln's election was yet another existential threat. The failed European democratic revolutions of 1848 provided rationale for American radicals on both sides of the secession question. As I've argued, radical 48 revolutionaries were a key part of Lincoln's core constituency and one of the men should be able to form their own government, in other words, popular sovereignty as opposed to the divine right of monarchs, was used by Southern radicals to justify their breakaway slaveholding republic. So I believe that this helps explain why at critical moments in history, such as the American Civil War, radicals from opposing sides of a crisis may be able to exert influence and even accelerate events despite the fact that the majority of the population holds moderate or even conservative views. The sectional crisis in the United States is just one example of a pattern that keeps repeating when issues of global importance reach their tipping point. In the 18th and 19th century, it was political crises that took center stage with the American French revolutions, the revolts of 1848, and then the American Civil War. All of these laid the groundwork for the eventual crumbling of monarchy in the Western world and the emergence of the modern nation state. In the 20th century, ethnic nationalism and economic crises brought other radicals to the fore. 
communists like Lenin, Stalin, and Mao co-opted and perverted the, the theories of philosophers like Karl Marx and others and created repressive authoritarian regimes that were in many ways the antithesis of Marx's original ideas. Radical fascists like Hitler converted ethnic pride into murderous ethnic cleansing. Radical presidents like FDR used the Great Depression as a rationale for his ambitious New Deal legislation, which included dozens of initiatives that were decried as socialists by his rivals. But by the end of the 20th century, of course, we had Social Security, unemployment insurance, Medicare, huge public utilities, all now bedrocks of a social safety net that would have been unthinkable to most mainstream Americans back in the 19th century. Here in the 21st century, crises like pollution, terrorism, climate change, world hunger, and substance abuse top the list of global concerns. Radicals on all sides of these important issues are jockeying for position as their ability to communicate to the masses has been amplified by technology. At some unknown point in the future, these pressing and universal issues like those that created the American Civil War will reach a tipping point. And when they do, we should expect that radicals from the fringes of society will emerge and become well-known names throughout the world. We can only hope that they have studied history and understand that they have a responsibility to act in the interest of all humankind to create positive and lasting change. And here is the commercial for the book. <laughs> and we'll be giving away a few copies, I think, Rich. Uh, so it's $35, that includes shipping. You can, uh, you can mail me a check to that address. You can PayPal me, uh, you can send me an email.